Okay, so we're going to have some look at uh, a brand new feature, which is a uh, Python for Godot as a scripting language. Uh, the good news is we are just uh, adding stuff. We don't want to kill any other script language, like for example, GD script. Uh, so it's just uh, good for everybody, I guess. Uh, I don't have to, to tell you why we should do this, because uh, it's awesome by itself. So we can just uh, throw look up how it will be done. And for example, uh, this is a kind of little snippet of what it, would, what it looks like. Uh, basically, it's really similar to GD script. The main difference are, for example, that you are using the def keyword to create function instead of the ugly func stuff that is... Uh, I don't know why they did that. I, it was a question I should have asked to Juan when he was online. Uh, yeah, so this is not really a big concern. What is more interesting is uh, you have all the import stuff working with Python, so you can uh, create modules and have a nice looking code. Um, you can have a uh, helper class, and uh, they are not they don't appear they don't appear from uh, from the Godot point of view. Uh, the only function that uh, will be seen from Godot is the function that are marked as exposed. So, for example, here we have uh, a class player which uh, extends uh, the node2d from Godot, and uh, we just uh, uh, make it available like this, and uh, it works, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, so we can uh, also use the uh, export system, you know, just like in uh, GD script. Um, this doesn't work yet, but I'm working really hard on it. Uh, and so you can use a signal and um, network stuff and so on. Uh, the key feature on the left, so it's for Godot 3 only. Uh, this means uh, we didn't, at the beginning I didn't want to to do some support on the 2.2 stuff, but the bad news is uh, the 3.0 version of the of the master uh, still keep breaking every few days, so it's a big pain. But they said it will be better in some few weeks, so let's keep hope. Uh, the only f the other thing is. It's really compatible. I mean, it's uh, really well implemented. I'm not thinking about uh, the Python stuff, but just the way in Godot you create a new scripting language. So it makes that GDScript and Python can be mixed together into a single project and it will just work fine. So for example, you see just a little snippet. If you put this in your GDScript uh, code, you will load uh, this Python stuff into GD script and it will act just like it would be normal GD script. Um, the next thing is um, Python is a really powerful language, in fact. So there is plenty, plenty of things you can do, and there is plenty, plenty of things you don't want to do in Godot. Uh, for example, everything which is uh, open related, you want to be able to open only the things that uh, should be available in Godot. So namely the things that starting by R E S slash slash whatever or uh, user slash slash whatever. You don't want to be able, for example, to you to create a game, then allow people to make modules like um mod and uh, some little cunning guys start uh, opening the player files like uh, his personal player files and start I don't know, maybe uh, messing with it by uh you know, uh, removing it or asking Bitcoin if uh, if you want to see them back uh, any day. So the thing is, uh, all the open systems must be must be stubbed inside Python to make it uh, only use the uh, Godot stuff. Uh, the other thing is, uh, with Python you can create new processes in order to spawn something else. But if you spawn something else, you can spawn, for example, a shell and do basically whatever you want. So you need to stop this also. And uh, yeah, there is plenty, plenty of libraries you need to remove from uh, Python in order to say, okay, uh, you can write things in Python, but you should use uh, Godot API to do stuff with the outside world. Uh, 
Uh, and yeah, the last but most important thing is this should feel Pythonic. So, for example, uh, in GDScript, uh, most of the time you don't do import, everything is uh, floating around, so you're like, okay, I'm going to use this keyword, but I don't know where it comes from. This is not what Python is, Python is about the explicitness, so that's why, for example, you have this import here to say, okay, this is the thing I want, and so I should be able to see them. Uh, next. Yeah, there was a little plot twist. It's it's not the Python you're used to. Uh, everybody's Python is a C Python, so it's a default implementation. And uh, there is some trouble with C Python. And uh, there is another implementation, which is a micro Python. It's uh, basically the same, but different. Uh, so there is a cons and there is a pros. Uh, the cons is uh, it's not. 100% Python, it's Python 3, so at least it's not 2.7 from the last century. But it's um, there is something like a meta class which are not available. When I say that, most of the people say, yeah, whatever, I don't need meta class. But then you realize that plenty of libraries are making use of meta class. For example, all the library uh, that allow you to access to database. So it means that. Yeah, there is library that won't work, and uh, when people want Python, they want Python because all of the nice libraries. Um, yeah, one of the biggest missing libraries is PDB. This is a Python debugger, and uh, yeah, if you have a scripting language but you cannot debug, it's not useless, but it means uh, it's a really big pain. You have to use print everywhere, and so it's not something you want. So this is a, a big need, and uh, I think somebody will have to do it no matter what. So uh, I guess if I end up doing uh, this port before PDB is implemented in MicroPython, it would be my job, so I hope somebody will do it before. Uh, the other thing is the documentation. The CPython documentation is really nice, but the MicroPython documentation is like uh, read the C code. So you get, you get used to it, but it takes time. And yeah, one final thing is uh, static heap. In fact, MicroPython is seen to be most of the time uh, directly embedded inside a hardware small device. So you just say, okay, on this kind of board, I have uh, this size of memory. And so you just uh, configure your, your MicroPython and compile it on saying there is only this size of memory and that's it. But what we want to do is, uh, you know, we are working on the on computer, on the Windows or even Android. It seems really big compared to classical embedded devices. And so you have a huge load of memory and you're saying, okay, I want for the start to use a small size of uh, memory. And then uh, when I will need more memory, I want to allocate a new, a new size of heap. And so I can continuously grow up according to my needs. But this is not possible right now in MicroPython, so you have to configure at the, um, yeah, in the setting of Godot, you say, okay, uh, my project is that big, so I guess I will use something like, I don't know, 16 megabytes of memory. So it's kind of, yeah, a little pain in the ass. It's not that horrible, but it's a bit. Uh, and now for something completely different, the nice thing about MicroPython, uh, it's really small, so it's really easier to just uh, take the C files and put them inside Godot and do your compiler to the job. It works quite well. Uh, it seems to be really embedded everywhere, so yeah, the compilation is nice. And uh, all the library, what I was talking to you in the last slide, saying you have to strip, the, you have to strip all this, uh, they're already stripped for you, in fact. So yeah, they solve the trouble most of it and uh, they want to make you available to choose what you need from python and what you don't need for example there is um, there is all the thing which are related to multi-threading in c python you don't have to choice it's only uh, one thread at a time can run and that's it in micro python they said okay uh, the good the good idea would be one thread at a time should run but maybe there is some people who want to do multiple threads and they are really careful. So you can just disable a flag in uh, the micro Python, you recompile it, and then you run without the gear. 
So you have to be really careful because everything will, is going to blow up if it can, but you can do it. So it's really nice, especially for a game engine when you want to have a lot of threads making different things like a network, for example, or game logic. Uh, yeah, so I made my next point. And uh, yeah, the really last point is uh, basically in the documentation, I already say they have uh, imp tried to implement C Python and it doesn't end well. So I don't want to make the same mistake. So for the moment, I stick to a simpler Python and we'll see. Uh, yeah, one next thing is uh, I was telling you about threads. So there is one difference between uh, C Python and MicroPython, which we're mentioning, is that in C Python you manage memory with reference counting. So basically, you create an object. There is a counter which says, "Okay, this object is uh, related to this variable." And uh, if you start to use this object inside uh, another variable, the counter goes up. And if the counter reaches uh, zero, which means uh, no variable is making use of this object, the object gets destroyed. So it's quite simple, it's really nice. It's uh, how it works in uh, GGScript, uh, I guess. Yes, no? Yes. Uh, yeah, because there is some trouble with this, like uh, circular dependency leaking, but it's another trouble. Uh, and th there is another way to, to do memory management. It's uh, so the garbage collector. So it's something totally different. It means at one point you stop everything and you say, okay, I'm going to look inside my memory what is connected to what. And so you will get the the memory which is still in use and you will get the memory which is free uh, the good thing about garbage collector is you can do you can do it at a different time that you are doing game logic because you are not increment incrementing or decrementing counters so in our example you see there is uh, the game logic which is here so basically it's gd script working and then after that you have uh, the physics engine the synchronization and i stole this picture from uh, one uh, dev blog, so I'm not sure what is the synchronization, but whatever. And so you have plenty of things running after the game logic, which are not related to game logic and to GDScript at all. So if you use a uh, micro Python, you could do just like this. And so you would have another thread, which you will start just after the game logic and will do the garbage collection for free. By free, I mean uh, you will have uh, just another thread running, so it's almost free. Uh, yeah, so now we can say about how to make this. Uh, the really nice thing is Juan already told you a lot about uh, how the engine works. So uh, I guess you all know the objects things. Uh, this is uh, in C++. Every, I mean, uh, every node, every uh, object from uh, Godot are uh, implemented like this in C++. So basically, you have uh, this kind of macro, uh, which define uh, some introspection stuff, like uh, the name of the class, uh, who are his parents, and so on. And after that, you have uh, just a function which bind inside this thing, which is called the class DB, uh, the name of the function with a function pointer. So in the end, you end up with uh, this class DB stuff, which uh, got all the reference on uh, the class that exists in Godot and uh, what are their parents and what are their methods and so on. Um, the only trouble with this is if you if you are if you want to have dynamic class. So, for example. Uh, you have GDScript, so you define a new class or a class that uh, extends another existing class and this doesn't work anymore because this is all this is defined at compile time. So yeah, it doesn't work. So this is why they created something else which is inside the script language.h file. Uh, this is a class script and basically what it does, it, it you have to define those methods that can give you dynamically what are the available methods in this script. So it's slower than uh, the, per, uh, the static things, but the good thing is you can resolve it at runtime. 
<coughs> so basically, what you need to do to have a new language working on uh, on Kodo is just implementing this. Almost. Yeah. First, you have, of course, to start up MicroPython. As I said, just implemented this thing and uh, his little friend, like uh, the script language is, uh, yeah, what is um, the extension of the file? For example, uh, yeah, if it's uh, if you want to load a file which is uh, end up in .gd, it will be the .gd uh, script which will be which will load it. If it ends up with .pi, it will be the Python script which will load it. Uh, after that, you have to do uh, the binding to those class because you want to be able to call those class from Python. It's not that hard to do. And uh, yeah, there is one thing a bit different is this is for object, but there is one thing on the top of object, which is a variant. Basically, in GD script, everything is a variant. And uh, in Godot, a lot of things are variants. And variant are kind of unions between a uh, built-in type, like uh, an integer, a float, a string, something like that, and more complex things like objects. So you have to be able, for example, to come to to bind um, a variant made of integer into a micro Python integer. And yeah, after you have done this, there is everything which is broken, like the garbage collector, and so you have to fix plenty, plenty, plenty of things. Uh, yeah, so if I have something more visual about the work, is here you have your Godot engine with um, the variant I told you about. The variant can be uh, built, in, built in types, or it can be a pointer or of uh, your object, which typically is a node. And after that, you want to be able to yeah, just have this module which reflect the, the same kind of variant, but in Python it's called mpobg underscore t. And uh, yeah, you want to have this is kind of proxy. I mean, when you're inside Python, for example, if you have a node, you want to have your node class from your point of view should be inheriting this object class because it's for you, it's the truth. It's a real object, but the in reality, uh, this object is just a proxy on this object, and this node is just a proxy on this node. And uh, yeah, on the lower corner, you can see there is some static binding and some dynamic binding. Basically, given Python is something really dynamic, you can do anything at runtime. So uh, there is some binding like the. Most of the variants stuff, like the integer or um, float, there are there are not much things need needed to do. So you can make them uh, statically, uh, so it's faster. But for more important things like the node, you better do it dynamically, which means basically you are calling the class DB, which register all the nodes, and you are, you are telling him, okay, give me all the list of object or class, sorry which are registered. And then you can, uh, from those lists, you can create a binding, which means uh, you create a Python class, which will call this, um, this Godot class. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, if you have a third party library, for example, you create, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, an, AI, an AI library, and so you've defined a new kind of object, which is here. So this object, is uh, will be will register to the class db stuff and so if in your python script you have done uh, static binding you wouldn't be able to bind to this thing because you didn't know about it before but given it is dynamic you can just ask for the list of things which has been registered and you will get it anyway even if it's another module so yeah that's a nice thing the other nice thing is as I told you, in Godot, in, uh, Godot 3.0, everything is broken, is uh, breaking everywhere. So if your binding is dynamic, even if it's broken, you're like, okay, I don't care. Most of the time. Uh, yeah, so now, what is done, what is not? Uh, yeah, it's working. We have uh, proof of concept. Uh, there is still, there are still buildings that doesn't work, like a vector 3 or array of vectors and uh, there is 
all these kind of small keywords, which are not much to implement, but for the moment they are not there. So my guess is we should be able to have everything working before the 3.0 is ready. And so we'll say, okay, now the 3.0 is released. Yeah, there is Python on it. Be happy. I hope. Uh, yeah, after that, I don't know, maybe in one year or in a couple of months, uh, the PDB module, I told you, is really, really important. Uh, and so, yeah, there is plenty of optimization possible. It doesn't mean it runs slow. I mean, uh, nobody knows now because there is no benchmark, but we anyway can make it faster. Uh, for example, uh, I told you about the garbage collector optimization, but you can uh, replace in uh, in MicroPython. One really cool feature is you can replace the bytecode, which is emitted from your your regular Python code, you can replace it to direct call to the C MicroPython API. It's a little bit complex, but basically you can imagine you compile your uh, .py file into native file and you get a two time boost, basically like that. Uh, yeah, after that, there is plenty of things inside the editor because uh, what's really nice is uh, in Godot, you have uh, your editor, which is really integrated. And uh, for example, the debugger, you want to, you want it to be there. You want uh, the performance tuning and this kind of thing. So it's plenty of little thing here and there to do. And uh, yeah, someone told me about uh, GDlib, which basically kind of allow you to have uh, just a shared module, which is uh, you download it. And on the other side, you download the regular Godot build and you put them together and so you get Python but you don't have to recompile your Godot engine so it seems really awesome and so I'm talking about the guys so you can make this uh, this dream true uh, yeah and so in a really really long time I guess maybe one day we will be able to do just a pip install Godot and then uh, in your regular C Python or PyPy you will be able to just a import Godot and it will run. I mean, this is like uh, the final goal, but it will be in far, far away. Yeah, wait for this. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Question? Yeah. Um in the beginning, you showed an example file with the um, exposed uh, attribute. Or, uh, so, my question is: uh, Will there uh, is there only one class for one file that can be exposed? Yeah, this is a really good question. In fact, you know, in uh, in GD script, you have one file equal one class. So. Uh, all the trouble is when you are doing this from GDScript, you say, okay, I want to load this file and you get a class. So you have to find a way to make this happen in other language that doesn't have one file equal one class. So the easier way is just to say, okay, I, ha I have one class and I just flag it. And I said, okay, in this file, there is one class which is flagged, and this is the class you should use when you load this file. If you have two classes like this, there will be an error. Um, you said there's no meta classes, but aside from that, as far as the core syntax of Python is concerned, what's missing as well in MicroPython? Uh, basically, every, everything is there. So it's like regular Python, but what is really important in Python is not only the syntax, but the library. For example, you have PyTest, and PyTest is a really awesome unit test library, but you cannot use it in MicroPython. So this is one example. Uh, there is plenty of little things, like, uh, you know, you can use uh, introspection in Python by using the dender dict attribute of a class and so for example we realized uh, yesterday that gender dict works really well for object instance but for class it break i mean it's not there so yeah there is a patch about this that was sent this morning so it's plenty of little things like that that will be 
I mean, eventually they will be corrected. But for the moment, they are here and there, little difference between Python, between MicroPython and C Python. But yeah, it's if you like Python, you will definitely love MicroPython. Uh, so you said you uh, excluded some uh, some uh, import like sys and os for like uh, because you don't want the user to be able to read other files or and just use the godot library but uh, actually godot allows you to read from the file system of course on platform that allows the application to read on the file system and it also allows you to spawn other process so like is there really a reason to to like uh, remove those library while maybe some uh, some user might prefer to use them instead of the the Kodo one because they are more used to Python for example. Uh, yeah, basically you're calling me a paranoid, yeah. and you may be true. But uh, the thing is, what you want is to allow the, the guy who is developing his game to have choice, and you don't want to make assumption for him. Uh, in the beginning, so uh, as I told you, in MicroPython you are, you can compile and you can configure a lot of things. So if you want to reactivate the, the for example, the spawning process, you can. It's really easy. But uh, the thing is, for example, the file system uh, in Godot, you can only access uh, area slash slash stuff. You should not be able to access something else. Or if you can, if you can. Yeah, so it should be a bug. I mean, games, I'm not sure you have access to Yeah, in games, if you use slash instead of uh, user, uh, you cannot do that for extend, but you can do that for, for uh, load, the dynamic loads. Uh, the no, yeah, so there was an issue. I guess, I guess this, is, this is an issue. This is, a, this is a Godot security hole from my point of view. So yeah, this should not should not be possible. So yeah, in Python, well, if why why is that? Because, because no one found it, I guess. No, no. Why is it a hole? Why is it a security? Yeah, hole? it's a security hole because uh, you are basically making a game engine, and so you can maybe. Uh, I mean, people are trusting you about this engine, so they to take your game and they install it. And so if after that, yeah, they are making, they are installing mods. You don't want the mods to be uh, able to destroy something on the on the user computer. I mean, it's. I think you have a flag uh, when you define a file access uh, API. You have a flag, a flag to define if you want it to access the whole file system or only resources. Um, oh. <laughs> I think there is a flag in the Godot API and by default it's limited to RES and user and you can define that you want actually to have complete file system access but you do this in your own game so for example if you're making um, a painting uh, program and you want people to be able to, fi to save uh, PNG files on their file system, then you want to have access to the whole file system because you want them to go in their home directory and then put it somewhere. But there is the default flag, I think, limits the access uh, and you can't just access everything uh, out of the box. So there is a security hole if the programmer uses the wrong flag. But by default, I think it's uh, mitigated. Mm -hmm. But sorry, the, the security hole is actually if you load uh, a Python script or a GD script from the internet. Like if the programmer loads something from the internet, then that's a security hole. But that's like having JavaScript uh, taking gavel. But that's uh, actually a programmer uh, error, not uh, not an engine problem. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would say yes, but taking a script from the internet is uh, just like installing a mod, in fact. So, I mean, uh, the security hole, you say, is getting a script from the internet, but basically you say, oh, look at my cool mod, and people will install it, and so you have your script from the internet, which is running on your game. And so you want to limit the access. Like, if you make your... If you make your game so it uh, 
destroy the user file system and the user installs your game and gets his file system destroyed, it's because that's what the program does. It's not a bug in the engine, it's a bug in the program. Like, I, I, I really don't see it. Yeah, but what you are seeing is you install a game and the game breaks your, your computer. So this is a trouble in the game. But now you install a game, the game is fun, the game is cool, and then you install a mod from the internet. Somebody else created a mod. So, you know, for example, you're in Skyrim and you want uh, your horse to be a pig. <coughs> it's just a mod. And you install this, and instead of having a pig, you have uh, a brick as your computer. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's like not. If you install an application, a third-party application. That's that's like every time you install a third-party application, you risk uh, someone to install uh, a virus on your computer. But that's yeah. But uh, every I application mean, has. You want to mitigate the risk, so if you allow anything, it's easier that if you allow a really small set of properties that are already in the game engine. The problematic is mostly for mods because if you give a system where people can easily provide mods, you don't want to have to test them all. And the people who install mods, they trust you as a game publisher. So if something breaks, they think you made it possible for the mod to break their system. So they won't check the source code of every mod before they install it, but if they trusted you as a game publisher, they will install your game and then they will try some mods and if the mods have access to more than they should, they can break the system. But I agree that maybe it should not be removed from the API, but there should be a way for the game developer to prevent access to <coughs> this stuff for mods or something like that. Um, I would also bet that you're legally responsible for uh, mods as well. I don't know the guidelines for the Steam community, for example, but um, I'm sure that you are the one in charge if there's a problem with what the users do. Mm -hmm. I, I guess. <laughs> All right, now that the uh, Serious discussion is over. Where can we find your awesome project? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the awesome project, as you said, is available on GitHub. Uh, for the moment, you have to recompile your game engine to make it work. And there is, a, I mean, the core features just like export are not ready. So you can play, but you can't play. You cannot play far enough to make an Android game. So and. As I said, it breaks because uh, there is plenty of different version, incompatible change in Godot 3.0. So I just say, if you want to help the development, you can just go and find the project. But if you want to make your Python project, just wait a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>